introduce John Blake, who is an old friend of mine. We knew each other when neither of us had white hair. And he was a reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. In 2007, um, he moved to CNN, where he has become a widely recognized, much read, and um, much honored um, blogger and journalist who he says has been writing largely on race in the last few years. He's also the author of a book called Children of the Movement that was published in 2004, and that is one of the reasons that he came to um, Piedmont's attention for this conference, though so he participated in an earlier conference called Religion in the Public Square. He was with us in 2013 for that. It was his book on children of the movement that really caught our attention for a conference on storytelling and how the telling of first-person narrative is the bridge between generations, both as we look back and as we begin to look forward. It is a book about the children of the leaders of the first American civil rights movement, some of us think of what we're in right now as the, the, the second American civil rights movement. Um, but that is that book will be the heart of the piece that he offers us today with plenty of time to talk to him afterwards. Um, but besides welcoming both him and his l wife, Terry Lynn, who always gives me such a delicious hug when I see you. I am so glad that you are both back here again. And I count you as old friends of mine and new friends of Piedmont. Bridge. Best Review on Amazon, Required Reading, Children of the Movement. This book should be required reading for anyone from the age of 10 to 100, but particularly for those members of the last several generations who may take certain freedoms and rights for granted. For anyone who may be only slightly familiar with the struggles, sacrifices, pains, and scars of those who fought for civil rights in America, Blake's book is a vital history lesson presented in fascinating narratives that capture the reader's attention from beginning to end. Please join me in welcoming John Blake. Uh, thank you, Barbara, and thank you, uh, Piedmont College, for inviting me out here. Uh, journalists don't normally talk before people, so bear with me. But I, I love sharing these stories. Uh, and um, I was telling someone uh, just before I came here that the timing of this conference is really incredible. Because I remember just a couple years ago when Obama was elected, I was uh, talking to a colleague of mine in the CNN newsroom. First I said, there's no way in the world this country is going to elect a black president. I'll make you a bet. And I lost. And, um, and the thing that surprised me, I said, well, you know, when he becomes, you know, uh, you know we, when we have this black president, I never believed that we would have this kind of post-racial utopia, that race would be a thing of the past. I never believed that. But I did think at the time that um, maybe things would quiet down a little bit. Maybe uh, there would be certain things, certain things or ways that people wouldn't treat. Uh, president Obama because he's the president. But I was kind of shocked, I got to admit, in the last couple of years how much, how much race has just exploded across the country. There's so much racial tension. Um, I don't remember the 60s, um, but I mean, the turmoil, I mean, I have to write about this a lot. So when I write stories, I get a lot of comments and, and feedback from people and the, and the viciousness and, and the tension that I feel out there. And you know Trayvon Martin, uh, Ferguson, all this stuff is happening at the same time this conference takes place. So I think the, the timing is good to talk about some of these stories. And what I wanted to do, just very briefly, I just wanted to share a couple of stories with you. And then after I do that, I wanted to open it up to any kind of questions you might have, because I like conversation. And typically, when I share some of these stories, uh, people have questions. And so, uh, to briefly restate again, I, I wrote the book Children of the Movement. And I was thinking last night, like, why did I write that book? I mean, you should, you should try to f explain that to people. And I remember when I decided to write this book, I wanted to write the book to be inspired. And I wanted to figure out, how can you take what happened back then and make it relevant today? And it occurred to me, that's the question these children of the movement have been living with all their lives. They don't have to wait for uh, something to happen in the media, like a fraternity, you know, racial hazing. They don't have to write, wait for somebody saying to Obama, you lie. This is the question you have to live with all your life if, say, you're the child of Dr. King or Malcolm X or Stokely Carmichael. But I didn't even 
confined my questions to people like that, but in my book I also talked to the children of the segregationist leaders. Like if you're the daughter of George Wallace, you also have to figure out how do I deal with what happened back then? How do I translate that into my life today? So I also talked to the children of segregationist leaders like George Wallace, uh, Ross Burnett, Governor Ross Burnett of Mississippi, a guy named Ma Mayor Joe Smitherman, who was the mayor of Selma when King came through in 1965. He called Dr. King Martin Luther Kuhn. So I talked to their children, and I wrote all these stories into this book, and I waited to be inspired. But I wasn't quite inspired because the stories went in these different directions that I, I didn't really anticipate. And one of the first things I discovered that was really strange for me, I would go to these really famous people, I mean, children of these really famous people, and I would ask them, like, oh, God, wow, what was it like to grow up with such a, fam a famous father? But the strange thing is I found out pretty quickly is that a lot of them did not know that their parents were such famous figures. They didn't know that they were these towering civil rights figures. Ever, I mean, it would happen again and again. They would tell me these stories about growing up and looking on TV and seeing a PBS special. And they would see their father like running from a mob. Like, wait a minute, that's my father. How did he get there? Or going to a class in high school, opening up a history book, and suddenly they see a picture of their father or their mother. Their parents never talked to them about that. I could never figure that out. Um, you know Malcolm X, right? Okay. <laughs> You never know, but <laughs> as journalists, we're taught never to assume. You know Malcolm X, but his daughter didn't. I talked to Ilyasa Shabazz, and she talked to me about growing up in upstate New York, very middle class existence, Jack and Jill clubs, private little summer camps. And she went to a black college. And, and, and sometimes among black people, what happens when you have children who grow up in a white setting, the black parents will send them to a black college to get the black experience. So that's what they did to her. And when she went there, all these students were so excited. You're Malcolm X's daughter. Oh, tell me about Malcolm X. Didn't he hate white people? Come on, tell us. And even before she could answer these questions, they elected her head of the Black Student Union. <laughs> They didn't ask her if she wanted to be the head of the Black Student Union, but they figured this is Malcolm X's daughter. You must want to be. And they waited for her to tell these stories, but the problem was she didn't have any stories to tell because her mother, Betty Shabazz, never really shared those stories. She said that she would grow up and the only time her, she would hear her mother talk about her father is at night, sometimes her mother would be dream, dreaming. And she would say things like, Malcolm, Malcolm, why did you have to leave me so soon? And the only kind of memory she could also see of her father is like a physical reminder. She could see some of his suits still hanging in the closet. But her mother never really talked about her father and all the civil rights uh, work he did. She said that when she took a class in college in civil rights, she had to go get her father's book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, so she could learn about it. And she told me about just being in her dorm room alone, reading that book and crying, never knowing what her father went through. I don't know if any of you have ever read that book. To me, it is so powerful, particularly at the end, because Malcolm knows he's going to die. He knows he's going to be assassinated, and he's so alone. And she saw that and read that for the first time as his daughter, and tears are coming down her face. So I heard these stories again and again. OK, I said, why is this happening? Why don't these children know about their famous parents? And I kind of figured it out. And this is what the conclusion I came to. Do any of you know uh, people who fought in war, like Afghanistan or Iraq or, or Vietnam? Do they talk about that experience that much? I don't think they do, because the experience was so brutal and, and so tough for them. And what had occurred to me, I thought about a conversation I had with Taylor Branch, who's the author of Party in the Waters. He said a lot of these civil rights activists were like veterans of war. He called them casualties of war. You see, because when I grew up, when I saw the civil rights movement on TV, to me it kind of looked like a Disney movie. You know, everybody's marching out in the sunshine, everybody's happy, everybody's singing freedom songs, everybody's surrounded by other people who believe like them. 
But that was just a very small fraction of being a civil rights activist in places like here in the 60s. Most of the time, you worked pretty much alone or with this other, this other small group of people. You were surrounded by people who wanted to kill you. Often, your family disowned you for what you were doing because they didn't understand. So a lot of these people went through these awful experiences of being, they're being ostracized, feeling alone, and often some of them were brutalized. They were beaten by mobs, they were taken to jail, they were tortured. They went through all these awful experiences. And the thing is, they became like soldiers. They had such awful experiences, such bitter things, that when they grew older and they had their own children, they didn't want to talk about it because the memories were too painful. This, however, left their children, though, in a very difficult position because people would come up to Malcolm X's daughter or someone else and say, well, how are you going to honor, honor your father's legacy? Well, the question is, well, how can you honor your father's legacy when you don't even know what it is? So I found that. That's one of the patterns I saw, and that was very odd. A second thing I found that was really odd is when I talked to the children of the segregationist leaders. Now, this is the part of the book that I, I felt kind of nervous about, because here I am, an African-American man. I'm going to be talking about these really sensitive racial topics with George Wallace's daughter. And the strange thing is, those were the easiest people to talk to in the book. They were the most fun. They were very relaxed. They weren't full of all these conflicts about what their parents did. And what I found out is that none of these children of these segregationist leaders thought that what their parents did, they never saw it as racism. They said that my father was just a politician. If you wanted to get elected in the 1960s, you had to be a segregationist. There was nothing racial about it. Yeah. I mean, really, I've thought about it. Uh, George Wallace's daughter, for example, Peggy Wallace Kennedy. I, I really like her. I just talked to her a couple uh, weeks ago. I was talking to her at a home in Montgomery. And I was talking to her about this great documentary on her father called Setting the Woods on Fire. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it is incredible. It's this documentary that shows Wallace and all his pugnacious glory. You know, he's segregation today, segregation forever. He's taken on hecklers in the crowd. I mean, it's, it's great. You see how he was just this really tough guy who was unabashed about being a segregationist. And I was talking to her about that. And I said, um, when you look at those old film footages of your father talking about segregation and nigga this and nigga that, how do you feel? And she got kind of quiet, and she kind of like looked aside. She said, I, I really get sad about it. And I asked her, I said, why do you get sad? She said, because when I look back, my father was just so young and handsome and strong. And when he got older, he was just so weak, and you know, he had been paralyzed by that shooting. But that's what I get sad about, because he was just so young and handsome and vibrant. And I thought to myself later, that's so sad in its own way that she never got sad about what he said and what he did. You see, people, as we know, died because of what George Wallace said and what he did. And, but she doesn't make that connection. She told me my father loved black people. Now, a lot of, some people here might know this. George Wallace was a moderate before he became this rabid segregationist. Um, and she said, my father's best friend was a black man. And she said, I saw how he treated all the servants in the governor's mansion. He would never let us talk down to him. She said, in fact, he left money in his will to one of his black friends. So he wasn't a racist. He, he was just a politician. If you wanted power, that's what you had to do. Now, I've been thinking about this for a while now. And, and this comes from something I, I wrote recently. I think we have to broaden our definition of what racism is. And I think things that have been happening recently have kind of shown us that. I used to think that racism was simply something I did to you. If I called you an N-word, or if I did this to you. And I think that's how Peggy Wallace and a lot of these children of these segregationists see it. It's something confined to personal relationships. And I talked to a professor who said it's more than personal. Racism is a system of advantage based on race. Good, well-meaning people who can have black friends, 
who can never have used the N-word in their life can get caught up in a racist system and do incredibly racist, brutal things. Take, for example, I don't know if you uh, heard about it, the Department of Justice recently came out with a report on Ferguson, okay? And when you read this report, it's sickening. You had this whole city in Ferguson that plundered the black community. They would use them, arrest them, find them, and because they couldn't pay, the fines went up. And that's how they made their money. And it gave all these examples of how the police were just, just arresting pe black people at random, walking, doing this, and just taking their money. Now, nobody used the N-word when they arrested somebody. Nobody said something, but this was a racist system. This was racism in action. But that was, that was deadly. And sometimes it can be something even more subtle. I read about this report about three years ago. I don't know if you've ever heard about this. Harvard University and I think Tufts University conducted an experiment. They, they got together all these job applications and they sent it to help wanted ads, actual help wanted ads in the newspaper. And all the applicants had identical qualifications. They were, qualifications were just the same across the board. There was only one difference, the, the sound of the name. Some names were very Afrocentric. You're nodding your head, you probably heard it. There was Lakeisha, you know, there was Jamal, and then there was the more Anglo-sounding names, you know, Tim, John, and they all sent these to the people. The people who had the white-sounding names got 50% higher callbacks than the black-sounding names. Now, the people who made that decision not to call Jamal back, but to call John back, could you say they were racist? They might not have never used an N-word in their life. They might have been in an interracial relationship. Some of their best friends could have been black. But that's something, that's a different form of racism. And the word I'm hearing more and more now is racial bias. You know, the idea that you can have these biases against a group of people that you're totally unaware of. You know, you don't have to use the N-word. I wrote this story a couple of months ago for CNN. It was called Racism Without Racist. You don't need racists to have racism. You just need racially biased people who, when they see Jamal, won't call him back, we'll, but will call Tim back. And I think that's what the children of these segregations didn't quite understand. Yes, your father had friends who were black, but he was caught up in a system, and he upheld a system that really brutalized people, and none of them understood that. Now, I met one son of a segregationist leader that was the worst. This is like going in a time machine back to 1942, and this was in Selma. Joe Smitherman was, the, as I said before, was the mayor of Selma. And all these protesters came through in 1965, and we had the Selma Movement and the Voting Rights Act. And Joe Smitherman was a small town white mayor who tried to resist him. He has a son named Stephen Smitherman who still lives in Selma. So I drove to Selma to talk to Stephen. And here I am talking to Stephen, and we start talking about race. And he says, well, you know, I use the N-word with my friends, but I don't think it's really racist. He said, it's just something we do. We don't take it too seriously. And then he began to talk about slavery. He says, you know, slavery really wasn't that bad. Slaves weren't mistreated. He said, because listen, if a farmer had a tractor, would he hit that tractor with a hammer? No, he wouldn't do that because slaves, they, would, they were brought from like dark and untamed Africa and given civilization. So he's telling me this, he's telling me, I'm sitting right in front of me and I'm hoping my tape recorder is still working. <laughs> but he is totally unaware of how he sounds. So I found that in my conversation and that was very strange. And there's a third group of children I talked to, and these, some other stories that stood out to me. These are the children of what I call the civil rights martyrs, the people who were killed, like we talked about Mr. Colonel Penn today. You know, today we have Trayvon Martin, we have Michael Brown, we have, uh, you know, these certain deaths, Eric Garner, that just become the focus of all this national attention. But in the day, in 1960s, there were other people who were murdered. And they became these huge, the focus of these huge national events. I'll toss out some names, and some of you might remember them. Viola Davis, you know? No, 
Viola Laiuzzo. I'm thinking about the television show. You know, I'm starting to get. <laughs> Viola Laiuzzo, Cheney Goodman and Schwerner, Mississippi. Um, Reverend James Reeb, who was killed in Selma. So what I did is I tracked down the children of some of these people who were killed, and I wanted to know what happened to your family when the television cameras left, when the news people, the newspaper and the journalists like myself, when we lost interest, and you had to pick up your life and move on. And these stories are some of the most surprising to me as well. I'll give you an example. I mentioned Mississippi. And you remember the story of Mississippi, Burner, or Miss, Mississippi Burning, the movie, which is an awful movie. It was very inaccurate. But we know the story about 1964, where three civil rights workers were killed in Mississippi. One black man, James Earl Cheney, and two Jewish civil rights workers, they were killed. What a lot of people don't know about that is that the black man, James Earl Cheney, he had a daughter. And she was born a week after he was murdered and she grew up in Meridian, Mississippi. And she told me that when she would go to high school, they would start talking about the history of the Civil Rights Movement in Mississippi. And when the section would come in the studies where they would talk about her father, she would never tell anybody who she was. I'm like, why wouldn't you do that? Because you should be proud. Your father is a civil rights hero. And then she told me a story that kind of explained to me why she didn't share the story. She said there was a shopping mall near where she lived. And when she would go to this shopping mall, she would see this, uh, this, this security guard. His name was Lawrence Rainey. And whenever she saw this guy, Lawrence Rainey, she would feel this knot of tension. Why did she feel this knot of tension? Because Lawrence Rainey, he was one of the men who killed her father. And I think as we heard this morning, I had this, this, this vision of the movement where all these people that murdered people like the civil rights workers and all, I thought they went to jail. That's what I assumed. I thought it was like, a, I tell my wife, I thought it was like a law and order episode. You know, when you find the criminal, you identify him, you put him to jail. But that didn't happen because Southern juries wouldn't convict him. And Lawrence Rainey, and there were like 18 other men who were implicated in these deaths, no Southern jury would convict him. So they just continued to live in the community. And she knew this was the man who killed her, but she would see him. And what could she do? How, does it, I mean, how would that affect you if you know somebody murdered your, your father and you have to walk around and see them all the time? And I asked her, I said, were you ever tempted to go up to him and say something to him like, yeah, you murdered my father, I don't know anything. And she said, no. I said, why not? She said, if I hated him, I would be like him. And hate is what took my father out of the world. So I can't give in to that. I just have to live my own life. And that's what she's chosen to do. And there was another person I talked to who was a child of a very famous person who was murdered. You remember Raven, Reverend James Reeb? OK. Did any of you see the movie Selma? OK. If you remember, and people who don't know, Reverend Jean James Reeb was a white minister who answered Dr. King's plea to come down south to help demonstrators in Selma. And what happened when he was there, he was attacked by a group of white men. One of them, they clubbed him on the head, and he died. Now, here's one of the hard truths about Selma. When a black man, Jimmy Lee Jackson, was killed in Alabama, I think just a couple weeks earlier, around that time, nobody really paid attention. But when James Reeve was killed, he was a white man, then the country was moved and shook. And Lyndon Johnson went on TV and he directly talked about James Reeve. He said, that good man. Well, I found his daughter, Anne, Anne Reeve. She lives in the Bay Area. And what is it like to grow up like that? And she was... She was like numb. There was no emotion in her voice. I think sometimes some people deal with tragedy by not feeling any kind of emotion. And you can still see that years later, she still feels the effect of missing her father. And I think one of the reasons she's numb is because the man who killed her father is, guess what? Still living in Selma. I, I was in Selma about a month ago. 
And I was talking to a woman named Joanne Bland who, was, who marched in the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And she conducts civil rights tours through Selma. And people will come by and she'll say, this is where James Reeb was hit. This is the Edmund Pettus Bridge March. And when she drives by this car business, there's a white man who owns this car business there. And when he sees the tour bus, he just waves at him. That was the man who killed James Reeb. He still lives in Selma. Not only does he still live in Selma, he's a very prosperous businessman. And most of his customers are black. Now, a couple years ago, the SCLC tried to organize a boycott of his business, but they couldn't get enough black support. This happens again and again. None of these people really paid the price. I mean, we heard about the gentleman who murdered you know, Colonel Penn. He lived by the sword and died by the sword. That is not the norm. That's the exception. I mean, it's, it, it, almost, it almost makes you question your belief in God or justice. When people who did the killing live freely in the community, but the children are the one who feel like they have to hide. What kind of world is that? Now, I don't want to depress you too much, so I'll end with this. <laughs> Those are stories that are very troubling, but I will end with this and open it up to questions. There were many people that really inspired me, and I'll mention two real quickly. One was a woman named Weta Burnett. She is the daughter of Governor Ross Burnett, who was a segregationist govern governor of Mississippi in the 60s. So here's this woman who grew up with this segregationist governor, Ross Burnett, and Mississippi was one of the most brutal states in the 60s. And I thought the way that she transcended her past and what she was taught was so beautiful. She traveled. She said she started to travel the world, just travel, travel, and that changed her. And she ended up teaching at a black inner city school in Jackson, Mississippi. And it made me think about something I wrote just a couple months ago. I don't know if y'all remember this, but you remember, there's so many racial incidents, it's hard to keep track of them. But you remember the Atlantic Hawks owner who got in trouble because he said that when whites come down to the Hawks games, they get uncomfortable because they're, they're in a small group, they're the minority. And I literally work at, at, uh, at the arena where the Hawks play. So when I leave work, when there's a big game, I know what he's talking about. I look around, I see all the black people coming in, but I don't, I don't really see that many white people, so I can relate to what he was saying. And it occurred to me, I said, you know, that would be interesting to write a story about white people who deliberately put themselves in situations where they are the more minority. And so I wrote this story, and the headline was, when you're the only white person in the room, and I talked to people like Bill Bradley, the NBA player, who said one of the most transformative experiences in his life came in the 1970s when he found himself playing with the uh, New York Knicks. And he was like one of the few, if only, white players on his team surrounded by black men. And it changed him to walk in the shoes of someone different. I talked to a white volunteer in Mississippi Freedom Summer. He went down to Mississippi Freedom Summer and he stayed so he lived in Mississippi for two years with black family. He told me, he said he lived so much among black people that he had to look in the mirror to remind himself that he wasn't black anymore. <laughs> but I think we all can relate to, to, to situations where whether it's race or it could be gender. You know, a man who's in a situation where he's not in charge, but he might be the only man or woman. And whatever kind of situation, it makes you grow. It helps you develop empathy. And that's what I saw in Weta Burnett. She had traveled, she had exposed herself, and she had become a minority. And it really helped her. I mean, it gives me hope for the, the future of this country because the reality is, in the future, white people will be a minority in this country. And it's, it's gonna be a new world. This is the, the step she has taken. It's like a sneak preview of the step we all have to take. So she was very inspirational. And the final person that really inspired me, and I'll wrap this up so you can ask questions if you have any, is Stokely Carmichael's son. You remember Stokely Carmichael? Okay. For those who don't know, Stokely Carmichael is one of my favorite people. He's one of the most fiery leaders from the, from the civil rights movement. He was the one who coined the term black power, black power. He's a very brave man. I mean, here's a guy, young man, 
1965, 66, going out to rural Mississippi trying to organize voters. So he was this fiery guy, and he was the one who felt like Dr. King was being naive about nonviolence, and he later joined the Black Panthers, and he moved to Africa. And I caught up with his son, and he was another person who didn't know his father was like this big civil rights leader because he grew up in Africa. And he said it wasn't until he came to the United States and went to high school, the people came up to him and said, your father Stokely Carmichael, black power, brother. He's like, you know. <laughs> but one of the things he told me, he just loved his father so much. And he told me that when his father died, Stokely Carmichael died in 1998 of cancer. And he said that when he visited his father at the hospital, his father was in the hospital bed. And Stokely Carmichael, he changed his name to Kwame I think it's Torre, if I have that right. Okay. And that when he had this, he had this uh, habit that when he would answer the phone, he would say, ready for the revolution. Because <laughs> he lived, he said, that's all my father ever talked about. And he said that when his father was dying, he would slip into delirium and he would say, you know, Bokar, don't you forget about Africa. Don't you forget about the revolution. And he was just trying to exhort his son, don't forget about the revolution. And I thought in a way that was so beautiful, that whether you disagreed or agreed or not with Stokely Carmichael's philosophy, that with his literal last breath, he was talking about revolution, about change. And his son was so in awe of that. And the thing about it, I see the same qualities in his son. His son doesn't see it because, see, one of the hard truths about this movement stuff and talking to the children is that there are some children of these leaders who want to cash in, you know? Dr. King's children, who I have known a long time and spent a lot of time with them. I tell people, they have a, they, it's a tough thing because your father belongs to history, but you want him to belong to you too. That's a, that's a tension, you know? And I know that they have told me that people made money off of their father, so why shouldn't I make money off of him? You know, Dr. King left his family broke. So that's something they struggle with, but it's a tension. I tell people, it's like a little joke I say. I say, Dr. King said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a dream, and for $9.99 and shipping and handling, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> that's the problem. You can't, can you have it both ways? You know, I, mean, I remember coming out to here at uh, the UGA at Athens to talk. And after I talked, it was about the book, a woman said, I'm so glad you came here because we tried to get one of the King children to come out here. And she wouldn't come out unless we sent a limousine and we paid her a certain fee. But here's Bokar. He said, people have offered me all these money to say things and do things. Here's a guy who graduated from the London School of Economics. You know, he works with community groups. He doesn't tell anybody who he is. All he wants to do is serve and help people and change the world. And I just thought that was so beautiful to see him and other people like that. I could go on and on about some of the people I met. But um, I guess the final thing I could say is I try to ask myself, you know, why are these stories important? You know, and I, I think on one level, I think it's obvious. You can learn from what happened then and you can apply it today. And you see, if we, as we've seen in the past couple of years, I mean, race, I, tell, I was telling my wife, like, it's kind of appropriate that yesterday was Friday the 13th. Because I feel like racism is kind of like Jason from the movies. <laughs> you think you've killed him, <laughs> but he keeps coming back. And it's like a virus, it just, it just mutates. Nobody's gonna really come out and say in the N word anymore. Like when I heard about, I don't know about you, but when I heard about the fraternity hazing and all that, that stuff doesn't bother me at all. Because it's, you cannot get away with that anymore. But when I heard about what the city of Ferguson did to all those poor black citizens, when I hear about that jo those job application experiments, those are things that worry me. And I think we have to see racism what it is today, not what it used to be. And these stories will help us do that.